Well, thank you for coming to Argentina. Um, we are glad to receive you. Uh, I want to ask you if this is the first time in Argentina. Well, I made a very short trip here about 20 years, 30 years ago. So I feel as though it's my first time. I've always loved Argentina. I've been fascinated by it. My own specialty is European history. So I'm very far from familiar territory. And that makes it more interesting. I'm delighted to be here and grateful for the invitation. Did you read something about Argentina? Did you know something more than tango or the uh, public things? Borges, Borges, Borges. So, uh, of course, we all read Borges. And I, uh, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I've taught myself Spanish only last year. Uh, I st study Italian a great deal and French, of course, but I never learned Spanish, and therefore I thought, here is this great language, I must at least be able to read it. So f every day now I read Spanish for at least an hour, and once I got the grammar down, etc., I read Borges, 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 and he was my introduction, so to speak. But of course, uh, I have many friends who study Latin American history. Some, like Jeremy Edelman, specialize in uh, Argentine history. Uh, it's a very important part of the world, but I don't know it as well as I should. Okay. Um, what do you think? Spanish is more difficult than French to study? Well. Uh, I spent all my life studying French. I write in books in French as well as in English. Uh, so it's part of me. Uh, but another part is Italian. And I find now when I try to speak Spanish, if we did, you would be shocked because it comes out half Italian, half Spanish. And my poor brain is very confused. But that's okay, because it's interesting, and I think everyone should learn new foreign languages all the time. Okay. Um, I want to know about your, your childhood when you were a child, and which was the first book that you read? Do you remember? Well, I do not remember the first book I read, but I remember the first book I read to my children. Will that do as an answer? Yes. So in a way, my favorite writer after Borges is Mother Goose. Mother Goose is the name we give for nursery rhymes. And nursery rhymes in English are fascinating because they have historical resonance. Uh, so when my children were tiny, I read them over and over again, hundreds of these absurd poems that we call Mother Goose Rhymes. Um, uh, wee Willie Rinky runs through the town, upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown. It's absurd, but fascinating. And uh, I've done some research on this. So there's something about nonsense uh, absurdities that appeals to small children and that actually communicates something about the world we have lost because many of these originated in the 16th and 17th centuries and by the time they evolved to today's children uh, their meaning is shifted but you can hear echoes of the distant past in some of these crazy absurd nursery rhymes. Um, talking about the books, do you prefer reading them or writing them? Oh, writing is hard work. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's my vocation, so I've done it all my life. But uh, make no mistake about it, to write a book is a tremendous amount of labor. It gives satisfaction. You might feel that you did the job you set out to do, or you might be disappointed that you didn't get it right enough, still, it is hard work. Uh, reading is a pleasure. Reading can also be uh, a matter of deep concentration. And I'm a slow reader, so I like to read slowly, to think about things, to make associations. I take a lot of notes. Uh, so 
reading is part of, in a sense, part of work, but then uh, I read to understand the world. And so uh, if you pick up some Borges, uh, you hope that you have got some somewhat better grip on the human condition. And talking about the books, actually, um, they have changed. They are the same as many years ago. Now we have the di digital uh, books. Um, what do you think that it's happening with the books now? They are still the same? Well, uh, we had no digital books before digitization existed. So obviously, the entire environment of books has been transformed. And I do not think it's an exaggeration to say this change is as great as the change produced by Gutenberg. We're living through it. It's fascinating. The World Wide Web began in 1991. Now for you as a student that may seem a while ago, but for me it was yesterday. Uh, and I think that uh, the po possibilities of communication through the web are fabulous. I have my own uh, website I've launched recently. It's Robert Darnton, one word, robertdarnton.org, O-R-G. And now it's just been launched, but there are many, many readers everywhere in the world who consult it and by doing so can have access to a kind of information you can't just get from a book because I have hundreds and hundreds of documents and short essays about the documents, along with images from the 18th century, maps, uh, all kinds of uh, media that come together in order to describe the world of books in the 18th century. That's the subject. That is simply not possible in a normal printed book. Now, I, will, I am in the process of now writing a printed book that will draw on all of the information in the website and some more, but still um, the website adds a dimension to this sort of history writing that simply did not exist before 1991. You are thinking about uh, writing nowadays a different type of book with sounds, with something special, more than the typical one. What can you tell me about that? Well, I actually have written a book uh, that I think is quite different from the normal book. It's a, uh, it involves a lot of research. In a sense, it's academic, although I hope it would interest the general public. The subject is street songs in Paris around 1750. Now, that may seem a very narrow subject, but it's an enormous one because at that time, the French did not have newspapers that is, papers with re news in them, how did they find out what the news was? They listened to songs. Every day, Parisians are writing new verses to old tunes. And then they sing these verses, which tell about recent events, many of which are critical of the king, the royal mistress, ministers, foreign affairs, the price of bread, uh, and I've found enough uh, manuscript collections of these songs to be convinced that they, they were everywhere. All of the streets of Paris are full of songs around 1750. I found the text of the songs, but I didn't know what they sounded like. So I went to the Department of Musicology in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and there I found the actual musical annotation of the tunes. The manuscripts just say, to the tune of, and they give you the name, but not the music. So once I had the musical annotation, I went to a friend of mine who is a cabaret singer in Paris, Hélène Delaveau. She recorded the songs to the original music, and the recordings appear, are available online free of charge. So the reader has my book and as an appendix I give the text of 12 songs in French and in English. And the reader can listen to the songs on the internet. So it's a hybrid book and 
it makes it possible, so to speak, to hear the past, to have contact with the past through sound that was not possible before the internet. So I see many, many possibilities opening up of a broader, richer way of conveying history. Okay, I'm going to ask you just two questions more to, to finish this, because they are asking. Um, I'm going to ask you about this event, what my university, UNTREF, ask you here uh, with the invitation. What are you going to talk and what they ask you? Well, um, of course, this particular Congress colloquium is devoted in large part to the Enlightenment. One of the key aspects of the Enlightenment is freeing the press, the liberation of the word. Uh, and uh, I have been studying censorship and the attempt to free the press over many, many years and just published a book about censorship. So my talk will be a kind of resume of the book, but it concerns not just censorship in 18th century France, that's one part of it, The second part is censorship in imperialist British India. And the third part is censorship in communist East Germany. So we have three different authoritarian regimes, three different languages, three different political systems. How did censorship actually operate in each of them? So by studying them together, I think it's possible to arrive at a general understanding of the nature of censorship, and that's the subject of my talk. Okay, and at last, uh, to talk about Harvard. Uh, Harvard is just one of the number one uh, universities of the world and has a, a very big um, library. Uh, which is, or which are the characteristics to have this prestigious university? What do you think that are the characteristics of this university um, to be one of the most important universities? Well, university should be universal. That's the idea. Th at, in the case of Harvard, uh, a tiny academy was founded with the first colonists who arrived in North America in 1636. Two years later, a man died and left his books to this tiny academy. His name was John Harvard. He gave 400 books to the academy and suddenly it had the largest library, 400 books in North America. Now, uh, it changed its name to Harvard. And since then, the university has grown around its library. The library is the heart and soul of the university. In fact, we have 73 libraries scattered everywhere, but the most famous building called Widener Library has uh, nearly 4 million books in its stacks. We have nearly 20 million total in 73 libraries, but the most famous central library stands at the heart of the campus, in the middle of the university. And that symbolizes, I think, the importance of the library for everyone in the university, including scientists who work in laboratories and download electronic databases without even knowing they get them through the library. The library is the channel of communication. So to be the head of this library, as well as a professor at Harvard, for me, was a very great responsibility, not just an honor. And my basic goal has been to open up the library to everyone, including you, by digitizing it and by making its digital collections available free of charge through the internet. Thank you for your time, it was a pleasure, and uh, well, see you soon in the Congress. Good, thank you for inviting me.